All right, so uh, let's, start, let's, let's start where I would have started uh, if I'd still been in the news business, which is working right off the news. Um, last night, uh, in case you were, you might have been watching the football game, but if not, uh, I think we had a presidential debate. And I noticed uh, Governor Edgar's wearing his blue tie, which I think is not indicative of any change in stripes. But let me ask each of you um, what your thoughts were about the debate last night and what, if any, effect you see it having on the home stretch of the presidential campaign in, in, that, in either order. Well, let me, first of all, I've always worn blue, Andy. Uh, USA Today got it wrong when they did those counties back in 2000. Uh, blue's always been my color. Uh, now, I have to, I think a lot of you know, I'm not a great fan of, of uh, Donald Trump, so what I say may be a little distorted because I went in a little with a bias, not caring for his candidacy. Uh, after watching the debate, I just reinforced that feeling. I mean, I just felt that uh, on that debate, uh, if that's what you're going to base, who you're going to vote for for president, Hillary Clinton was far better than uh, Donald Trump. She was better prepared. She was better on the issues. She just seemed more presidential than he did. Now, saying that, Donald Trump has amazed me throughout this process. I never dreamed he'd be the Republican nominee for president, particularly after some of the things he said in his campaign, particularly the remark about John McCain. Uh, but he continues to roll right along. So that's my take. But my take, I've learned, is probably not maybe in the mainstream of the voters out there. Well, maybe not the voters, Gov, but it certainly reflected what most of the debriefs afterwards suggested and some of the polling suggested a fairly easy win for Hillary in the debate, which may or may not have any impact on the election. Chris, what do you think, not just the debate itself, but whether you think it's going to have any effect on what seems to be a, a dead heat right now? Well, I, don't, I don't know whether it's a dead heat. I, I'd say that in all likelihood, Hillary wins this going away. It, Elections are really about votes, and this election is about the electoral college votes. And the way she's positioned now uh, gives her really an outsized chance to win, likelihood, and a really difficult path to victory for him. This election is interesting to me because it's the first time really since the Southern strategy was developed where the two candidates are fighting for the middle. They're fighting for the undecided. That hasn't happened in like five uh, election cycles. The last election cycles were all about turning out our base, the Republican base and the Democratic base. This is really a fight for the middle, to get undecided voters to vote for one of those candidates. And I think based on that, Hillary won last night. I don't think there was anything that um, Trump said that would convert an undecided voter to his side. I think when they asked him a relatively softball and predictable question about race relations, you know, what would he do about it? And he talks about law and order. That's, that is not what undecided African Americans want to hear. And I think he loses on that. And when he loses on that, it makes it nearly impossible for him to win eventually. And you, you had, now let's yeah. just segue really quickly into what has been, I covered presidential campaigns at NBC and ABC going back, I think, I think to the late, the mid-70s, and I never remember a campaign season like this one. There have been odd ones, but nothing quite like this, and never a candidate quite like Trump. You had some thoughts about what, what the dynamic is this year, how somebody who's a reality star basically beats 15 people with arguably decent uh, governmental service resumes. Well, there's no doubt there's a lot of people out there unhappy with things. I think part of that is that's what they hear every day from the media about how bad things are. Uh, and so they, they want to change. And Trump would definitely be a change. Uh, but, you know, let me, this election, I, I don't think this election is all that much different. I still think this election is going to be about turnout, which uh, in a presidential year usually is not a big issue. but. Particularly as I look at Illinois, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton should carry Illinois. We're basically a democratic state. If she doesn't, then it's going to be a landslide for Donald Trump. But the key here, and I think maybe throughout the nation, is turnout, not the total number, but who turns out. Uh, I think Hillary Clinton has to do very well with African Americans, almost as well as Barack Obama, to, to be able to win. 
I'm not sure she was doing that well. I think last night helped her. Uh, Donald Trump, uh, you know, he's going to have to do well with blue-collar workers, people who maybe traditionally vote Democratic, but they might vote for him. Uh, I'm not sure. Again, I, I agree with Chris. I don't think he won anybody over. Uh, the, the key for a lot of presidential elections, a lot of elections, have been suburban women. And I think it's still the key in this election. Uh, suburban women are more times than not Republicans, but if they switch and vote Democrat, it's pretty hard for a Republican to win. And uh, again, I think the debate last night probably helped Hillary Clinton in her attempt to, to win over those suburban, particularly women voters. Uh, so turnout's going to be the key. If, if she can get a good African-American turnout, if she can uh, do well in the suburbs, then I think she'll win. Uh, if she doesn't do well, then I think uh, that Donald Trump, uh, with a lot of disgruntled voters out there, uh, could do better than a lot of people thought. Now, I have to say, after the debate last night, uh, I definitely think it was a huge plus for Hillary Clinton. Uh, we'll have to wait and see what the polls say. Now, I've, I, I covered you for many years and have known you for even longer, and I don't think I've ever seen you uh, disaffected by a Republican candidate at this level quite like this. I mean, you've, you've supported them all, maybe occasionally holding your nose, but what's the difference this year? Why is it so much harder for you with Trump? Well, we don't have time for me to go through the whole list. Uh, <laughs> but first of all, to me, a president, the most important thing that a president does is foreign policy. Uh, the economy is very important, but the Congress has a say on that. A uh, president can get us in a war in a matter of seconds before Congress has a chance to even blink an eye. Uh, and so I think a presidential candidate has to have some preparation for international affairs. And again, I, I just don't see it with Donald Trump. In fact, his personality is such that I think it could, uh, could cause us some real difficulties. With He says things off the cuff. Now, I have come to appreciate a lot of the things he has said, I don't think he really means. He does say things for shock. But a president can't do that. Uh, a president has to choose his words very carefully. Uh, how he or she conduct themselves is very important. And again, I, it just strikes me this, he just doesn't have that. Uh, and I've never voted for a Democrat uh, for president. I've always voted for the Republican candidate. This will be the first time I will not vote for the Republican candidate for president. And, uh, and I say that, and it, it kind of bothers me as a Republican, but the presidency is too important to let a partisan identification keep you from making the correct vote. You'll be voting for Hillary or one of the third party candidates? It's a secret ballot. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, you gave us half of a news lead. We just didn't get the other. The others, I know I've said the other before several times oh, okay. I mean, about uh, not voting for Trump. So I'll say the thing about the, the Trump candidacy and sort of reflected a little bit in, in, the, in the governor's remarks, this notion that he, he can say things that are outrageous, that he can lie, he can reverse position, he can do things that have never been allowed before in a presidential election. Nobody's ever gotten this far. And it's sort of incredible to me. And I think it's reflective of this notion that, you know, there have been these enormous swing votes the last uh, five, six election cycles, really be beginning with uh, President Obama in 2009 and 2010, you see you know, uh, enormous swings, 2012, 2014. And I think there's this notion, this burnout, that people are sick of candidates making promises that they're going to bring change, that the Democratic Party is the party of change that the Republican Party is the party of change. And those, those promises have not been kept. And there's this enormous frustration among Americans. I mean, we are not in a recession, but most Americans think we are. And they're mad. And they're like, I'm mad as hell. I'm not taking it anymore. I'd rather vote for that guy and blow the whole thing up. And that's a really ugly message that all the people in this room who are part of the establishment of either party, we need to we need to worry about but that. But you don't think it's you don't think that's enough 
to carry the day. You think that in the, in the key states, she still has the big edge? I, I absolutely think she wins, and it's nearly impossible for him to win the Electoral College, unless there's some enormous event that sways voters in the next 45 days. But that's not really the, the point. The point is, you know, half the primary voters voted for somebody who was willing to radically change the American economy. Most people don't like where the country's headed. They think we're on the wrong track. That's a Trump and the Bernie Sanders phenomenon. Absolutely. And the fact that so many people are willing to put up with a candidate who repeatedly lies, repeatedly changes his position, knows so, so little about what he's talking about, and they don't care. They're like, it doesn't matter. We're sick of the rest of you. We want your way of life to change radically. And that, I think, should scare well, let, before Jim, before you, but I want, yeah. so you've watched a lot of campaigns. Uh, you, I don't know if you were too young to help a, an uncle get elected president. You've watched a lot of campaigns. Um, what is there anything Hillary Clinton can do to disabuse people of this notion that she is a lying, dishonest, untrustworthy candidate? I think one of her biggest problems is people not knowing whether she'll carry some of those alleged traits into the White House where it's more dangerous. Uh, set up a, I mean, you know, set up sis offline systems in the White House and, you know, foundation-related activities that undermine foreign policy. True or false, those things have been, have been extraordinarily damaging to her image. I think that she is not a natural candidate. She, that is not where she rose to power through, you know, campaign cycles and being a charismatic uh, politician. That's not where she's comfortable. She's never been comfortable on the stump giving speeches. She's comfortable in a conference room surrounded by a group of experts getting into the details. She's probably the most respected freshman senator in the last 50 years. More, and, and that goes for Democrats and Republicans. The Republicans who served with her think of her very highly. They think no one worked as hard as she did, got into the detail, understood the process, understood the ramifications, worked them, and tried to convince them to support her legislative agenda. They like that about her. But people who are good at that sort of wonkish stuff are not natural politicians. And I think that's what you're sensing. Someone who is trying to be somebody that they're not, which in this case is to be a politician. And she's not great at that. But she is incredible on the policy. And I think that carries the day. Gov? Well, I was just going to say, even though we're, we, we're not speaking highly of uh, Donald Trump, I still think he has a, a reasonable chance of getting elected president. Uh, so you disagree with Chris the about the, the, the important states being put Well, I, I think they're, they're leaning toward Hillary, but they're not leaning as well as they were, unless the debate last night changes a lot of mind, and I'm not sure, you know, I'll believe that when I see it, just from past debates. Uh, so... Again, this, this election is far from over. And, uh, you know, it, things could happen, new things could happen. But, uh, you know, you, every time Hillary begins to look like she's built up a, a lead, then it, it seems to disappear. Let's leave one quick presidential question and then uh, one, one more on the national scene. A prediction on uh, Congress, both Senate and House. Uh, Senate looks like a toss up, House. How do you pick up 40 plus seats? Either of you have a sense of uh, one of those or the other going in an opposite direction from the current Republican holds? You know, if, if Donald Trump would just completely collapse now in the polls and among the voters, then perhaps you might see the Democrats uh, be successful. Uh, the House, I think, is a farther stretch than the Senate. Uh, but I think both of those are in doubt at, as if this is as close as the polls have indicated, they're not going to get the bounce. The Democrats aren't from the presidential thing that maybe they thought a month ago. Uh, now, we're still, how many days? 60 days? Well, I mean, you know, there's still time that can all turn around. But right now, I don't think if I was the Democrats, I would feel quite as positive as maybe a month ago. 
Chris, you've had a number of family members in Congress. I don't know, what do you have a couple now? There's usually one or two at any given time. <laughs> I, can't I can't remember. There's one. Just one. I have a nephew, Joe but, Kennedy so what, from what, Massachusetts. And, and I say that only because I know you pay closer attention since it's close to home. What's your sense of the two chambers and the likelihood of any change? Well, as usual, I think the governor is you know, right on target in terms of uh, what will happen, the presidential uh, race and how that will affect the races in both the Senate and the House. I don't think people um, ticket split like they used to in America. Generally, you'll vote you know, straight party, even though it's harder and harder to do that, but people really don't do that as much. Uh, at least the exit polling is, has shown that. Um, so I think what happens to the presidential uh, race matters, but if you look at some of the overnight, uh, I um, had access to some of the actually Republican data that came out last night where they had focus groups which were breaking you know, 17 to three in favor of Hillary. So I think that'll, she'll get a great bounce out of that debate. Um, whether, the, whether Trump agrees to the next two debates, I think is very much up in the air. You could I actually see a candidate bail on a debate? Oh, I think that's I don't very- think ever, Has that ever happened that's, before? I, I think he's, he does not want to be, you know, they're complaining about Lester Holt. I mean, really, what did he do wrong last night? And when you're complaining about the referee, it means you lost the game. Um, and, and, and I think he's really worried about coming up against Anderson Cooper and is now trying to create this notion that there's bias in the mainstream media. And you were part of that. You can speak to that as well as anyone. Um, and, and he may you know, drop out of those debates. He needs them more than she does. And I think he has to win the middle. And it's a really, really tough path to victory, given the Electoral College. One more question on the presidential gov. Uh, does uh, you, one theory is that the Republican Party will have a hard time recovering from Trump. I don't, I think of these things as being short-lived. If he is to lose this election, I think it's almost like within a few months, it's like he never existed. And I think the party comes back. I mean, do you think that the party's going to have to do anything differently to recover if he loses the election? Well, I think the re party's going to have to go back and remember the lessons that I thought they learned four years ago when uh, uh, Romney lost to Obama. Uh, one area is the Hispanics. I mean, I can't imagine an Hispanic voting for Trump after the things he said. Uh, I mean, just there are things we're going to have to get over. But I agree with you. I think that it's not like Trump has a lot of ties in the Republican Party, controls a lot of things in the party apparatus. Uh, uh, I think that if he loses, he'll be gone. Doomsday predictions over. tend to be really, really just yeah. momentary. I mean, this country still is a, a two-party country, even though there's more Democrats and Republicans. Uh, it's, it's still, when it comes to presidential politics, uh, we go back and forth. And so I, I don't think this is the end of the Republican Party, but hopefully the Republican Party gets back on course and uh, does a better job than I think we, we, we're doing right now, trying to appeal to the, to the middle, because that's where most of the voters are. And unfortunately, our primaries have a tendency to, in the Republicans, the right has much more say, and then the Democrats, maybe certain left elements have more say. Uh, but in the general election, the middle is the key, and that's where most Americans are, and we need to, as a party, I think, understand that, and we need to, to move that way more than we have in the last few Presidential Do races. either of you have a prediction on Kirk Duckworth? Uh, and in the context of this historically being a state that favored Obama and, and kind of views Hillary in part as kind of like a homegrown candidate she's from, she's more homegrown than Obama was, but I doubt if it's quite as easy for her as it was for him. What's your take on the impact on the Senate race with the dynamic that you're seeing in the presidential if one affects the other at all? Well, I'd just like to oh, sure. make a follow-up comment notion of the future of the Republican Party. I think the country is much stronger if there are two parties and both parties are strong and they're both fighting for the middle. And one of the issues that I think comes up with the, with the Trump um, comments, particularly about the, the Latinos and, and Mexicans, is that I think suburban women, which is really an important swing vote, I think they don't want to vote for a racist. They don't want to vote for a racist. They need to hear that the leader of their party is not a racist. And I think Trump is 
not doing a good enough job dispelling that notion about himself, and he will alienate those suburban women from him. And I hope, I hope long term we have two parties. That's what I'd say. So let me, Kirk Duckworth, a prediction or anything interesting? I mean, it's pretty unusual. You have two injured veterans, injured in different ways, but uh, two, two people who qualify for disability assistance. Well, I, I think right now, probably, I mean, the polls show it's leaning toward Duckworth, but huge undecided. I mean, it's amazing how many undecided voters. Now, historically, undecided voters have a tendency to go for the non-incumbent, uh, but I'm not sure that many people have an opinion yet on Mark Kirk, even, even though he's been in the Senate for six years. Uh, the fact that he has distanced himself from Donald Trump, I think, will help him in those suburban areas that he's going to need to pick up some votes. The question, does that alienate, uh, particularly downstate, some Republicans that may not vote? I think in the end they'll vote for him. Uh, so I really think that race might be closer than the polls indicate right now. Uh, and, but it, it hasn't got that much traction. You don't hear many people talking about it. And so as a result, even fortunately, we no longer have straight party voting in Illinois, which I thought was a terrible thing, and we don't have it. Uh, still, that race will be affected maybe more by the presidential outcome because it hasn't got as much attention as maybe it warranted. Well, there's going to be, I, I haven't played, I, not as a political reporter anymore, I'm going to guess there's a debate or two that will come up with those two and, and more ads. Do you think that basically there just isn't enough oxygen I, in the room for I that I think race? the only debates people watch are the presidential debates. I was in gubernatorial debates and... Uh, you know, outside of a few insiders, I'm not sure how many people watched him. You don't think there. everybody watched those debates that I moderated when you were running for Secretary of State? Well, that one I know nobody watched, it, even the moderator. <laughs> yeah. But no, I, I think debates are overrated. Uh, presidential debates, um, I, there's no doubt the uh, Nixon-Kennedy, uh, the first debate had an impact because Nixon didn't look good and Kennedy looked presidential and brought him up. Uh, I think the Bush debate with... Uh, Al Gore, that first debate, changed that election. That's probably the one that had the most impact. If, if you remember, uh, George W. was about 10 points behind Al Gore. And then Al Gore, people, they spent an hour and a half with him for the first time. And I think they decided they didn't want to spend four years with him. I mean, it, the numbers just changed overnight. I mean, I, that was probably the most decisive presidential debate. I can't remember if he yawned or something. It was kind of, he had a disaffected look that basically haunted him. Well, he kept, every time Bush said something, he kind of grunted. And, I mean, now, Trump did that. I don't know what Trump, if he had a cold last night or what, but uh, he, he should not have brought up stamina, I didn't think, uh, the way he was acting in that debate. But uh, I don't think debates, I don't think that'll have a huge impact on the Senate race, unless somebody says something very but I, my guess is it'll be very guarded. Uh, I think I think um, I think Duckworth's story resonates with people. I think that particularly this year, and really is a counterbalance to the terrible rhetoric of, uh, of of the Trump campaign. But that notion of an immigrant family serving the country, being wounded, giving about as much as you can, and then the perseverance. People like that narrative and they will respond to it as they tune into this election. Well, well, one of the, the, there's a theory out there I've heard nationally that people might end up, some Republicans, some independents will vote for Hillary, but they want a check and balance, and then they'll go vote for the Senate Republican candidate so they have a check and balance. Americans love that check right. and balance. And I well, think, that would help Kirk. I think Mark Kirk, uh, because Mark Kirk has, as a senator, has a very moderate voting record. He's, he's positioned himself. He's, he's broken with the party on some issues. So, you know, I think that could help him. I mean, in Illinois, I think that's one of the reasons he won six years ago. He was viewed as a moderate. Uh, and uh, so, I, I, again, I think that race might be closer than a lot of people think today uh, because, again, there's so many undecided. And now how they break uh, will, will determine that election. I think that's a really great point, that notion that people are concentrating more on the Senate races now. And instead of the presidential race, uh, particularly the insiders. And you look at the Koch brothers basically abandoning the presidential race, you know, unhappy with Donald Trump, and really concentrating their funding efforts or the Senate races for the very reasons that the governor lays out, the notion of checks and balances and their ability to perhaps preserve the uh, Senate majority. But the thing with Kirk 
is he's not polling well enough, and that big money, particularly the Koch brothers' money, is not flowing to him. They've made a decision about that race. And the problem with those guys making a decision about your race, if they think you're unwinnable, they're not going to invest in it because they don't get any return on that investment. And they're like bell cows. They are going to lead the rest of the big Republican donor base, and they will all decide now not to support Kirk. And you really need that big money coming into these races. And it'll, it'll hurt his ability to compete over the next six weeks, which leaves him at a huge disadvantage as he goes into the last part of the election cycle. I don't want to bog down with a lot of the reform stuff I talked about in the first half of the program. That's our watchdog work. That's our mission. Come on, give that speech again. <laughs> I, I've given it twice. I gave it in Chicago two weeks ago in a fundraiser there. All I did was recycle the same language, minus the Chicago references, and a thanks to Jeff and Jennifer. That hey, was this the only is change. all original material from the governor, That's right? right? <laughs> That's what you're getting from us. Hey, so just one question. Um, between, and, and take your pick between the Supreme Court decision on the maps and AVR, any of those reform issues that you think are really important going forward, uh, or do you think that we're off base in putting so much out? Look, I happen to think that, that there's just too many disengaged, disaffected people out there, and we've got to bring them back into the fold, and the only way we do it is to reconstruct the system to basically favor the, the, the participants, not the insiders. Well, I'd say you... You know, you had a great list of reforms, but the notion of going to an elected body and saying, will you willingly impose limits on your careers or make it more difficult for you to get elected, like, that's crazy talk. <laughs> and I think, I think the one thing that you might have added to that list is the notion of I got citizen a shrink appointment in 15 yeah, minutes, sorry. so we better wrap this up. But, the notion of citizen-led referendum, and that's very difficult to do in Illinois. And if you want great change, that's a route in. Well, that's a great thing to say, Chris, because that, will, ah. in, that invites a question for the governor because it goes back to where you and Don Netch were, was it four or eight years ago? There was a lot of talk about having another convention, like set 1970, to deal with a lot of these things, and you and Netch uh, formed a, a, an odd couple alliance, having beaten her in the, in the governor's race, in which you both were against a convention. I believe it was the same grounds, too expensive for too little benefit, or maybe insiders would control it the same way they do the system now. But do you think, given what's happened in the courts and what's going on, that maybe it's time to revisit it again? No, I'm, I'm not, it, it hasn't gone that far. I think that'd be, <clears throat> rewriting the Constitution, I think, would be extremely dicey. Uh, I, there's nothing wrong with our Constitution. What's wrong is some of the people we elect, and I think people need to pay a little more attention who we're nominating. That's the key, the primaries. We gotta have more people. So the list you had up there, I have to say, the open primary, moving the primary to the summer, I think that's great. I tried that. In fact, I brought the parties together when I was governor, when I proposed an open primary. Republicans and Democrats came together to defeat that. <laughs> Uh, because it is, it's kind of Chris pointed out, you're challenging the status quo. I mean, they got elected in the old system. They don't want to change that. But I do think more people in the primary and would, would be good. I think a primary in the summer, not in the dead of winter, would be good. Uh, I think changing how we do districts, and I did redistricting when I was a staffer. And you supported the map. I amendment. support the map. I think that's, that's important. Uh, I think all those are good. Now, are, is that the most important thing facing Illinois? No. The most important thing facing the state of Illinois is to get a balanced yeah, budget. Exactly. That just, everything else pales compared to that. So I agree with your list, but as far as what Illinois ought to be doing right in the state government, we need a budget. We need a good budget because this state is falling apart. Well, that's our event after the election. Let's one thing at a time. Well, uh, but that, I think, enters into the election to some extent. I don't think any of these issues are going to sway this election. Uh, at the state level, we haven't talked about the state. I don't know if you want to yeah, I'd like move you into to, that. Yeah, I'd like you to. Well, so, uh, and, I, and you broke with the governor on this whole issue of priorities and, and strategy. Well, I, I broke on, we disagree. Um, I think the budget is so important, we shouldn't have every, ever, other things as contingents before we do a budget. I think the budget needs to be done, a good balanced budget, which means ample appropriations and ample 
revenues. It's going to be cuts. It's going to be taxes. I mean, it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be easy, but that's what we need. But that is what I... I think some of the other things he's done, he's, you know, he's a very active guy. I think he's done some good things. I, I, I think that's my, my, where I really... And how about, the, how, about the, how about the administration argument that once you do the budget, you have no leverage for the other things? Uh, the governor the, has the agenda, leverage. This turnaround no. agenda is dead because you have nothing to leverage it with. Well, I, I think a governor, if, if you get a good budget, you're going to get this state moving. Right now... The and this is not the purpose of this thing today is to talk about these issues, but a couple. Uh, you know, I worry about what's happened to higher education in the last year, and we have thousands of young people in Illinois leaving Illinois to go to school out of state because of these budget problems. And to me, economically, that's the most important thing to our future is brain power and these young people. And if they go away to school, they may never come back. So again, I I think. If you want to get this state moving again, we've got a good need to get a good budget in place. Unfortunately, for many years before Governor Rauner was there, we did not have a good budget, balanced budget. And this is a problem that's been festering for years. We need to deal with it now. But I don't know how much impact in this election. I do think the budget resolution is an issue in the state elections. I mean, if, if you look at this state election, this is a unique state elections. Yeah, what do you think of an election in which collectively we could see $50 million spent for these legislative races between the two sides? Well, and most of it coming from one side. I mean, Governor Rauner has provided more money than I've ever dreamed it would be in Illinois politics. Uh, the numbers we're hearing that's being spent. Now, the Democrats, Madigan's always been pretty good at raising money. Nothing compared to what Rauner is injecting into this election. And what impact that's going to have, I don't think we know yet. My take on the state when it comes to legislative races, it's hard to defeat a downstate incumbent. They're well known. Unless there's a scandal or redistricting, it's hard to beat them. So I'm not sure all that money that's being poured in to try to defeat some of these Democrats downstate will be successful. Though I do think Trump will run well downstate. Well, that might help. Now but, a lot of money's flowing into the comptroller's race. Well, so. let me finish. Let yes. me get some. Uh, in the suburbs, though, where I don't think people know their legislators as well, they're much more apt to go how the top of the ticket goes. They're more apt to respond to television. And the amount of money that Governor Rauner has been able to provide to Republicans in these legislative races is huge. And I think that's going to buy a lot of television time up there for legislative candidates, which is very unusual. That very well could have an impact. And it, you, I think if Republicans are going to make gains in these legislative races, they have a better shot in the collar counties where this money, I think, will have an impact as opposed to downstate. Now, the offsetting thing is, is Governor Rauner's numbers are not very good personally. I mean, his numbers are upside down downstate. In the city, it doesn't really matter. There's no really legislative races. That, maybe that McAuliffe race a little bit. Uh, but... In the suburbs, his numbers aren't as bad, so that's not going to be as much of a problem. But uh, it's going to be kind of Rauner's money versus Rauner's record. And uh, I think in the suburbs, Rauner's money is going to probably well, Republicans help. are making Madigan the issue. We've made Madigan the issue for years. <laughs> I mean, when I, had my, when I ran for governor in re-election, I had quadruple bypass surgery. I dedicated one of the bypasses to Mike Madigan. <laughs> I mean, it, it, we, we've done that. And, uh, I, most voters, you know, they're not voting on him. They, the governor is a much more visible thing than the speaker, I think. Now, I will say, I think the Madigan name has been tarnished some, what, in the last two years. Uh, between the Tribune and, and Rauner and all, I think the name statewide has got a problem. But I don't think that's going to affect legislative races as much as the governor. And, but I think Rauner's money, particularly in the suburbs, could offset that. Controller's race. We talked before, and I was going to talk more state anyway. Uh, the controller's race, I thought until recently, we don't elect a U of I trustees anymore. We used to in Illinois. Political scientists loved that. That was how you could figure out who was the base Republican voter, who was the base Democratic voter. We don't do that anymore. I thought the controller's race was going to be that, because that's really hard to get people excited about. 
the, I mean, there's no spatial interests that care really about the controller. It's not like Treasury, at least the banks do. So it's hard to raise money. People don't get excited about it. Maybe a few insiders do. So I thought that's going to be who's Republicans, who Democrats. Now that apparently we've blown the caps, and that means Governor Rauner can, can come in and provide millions for his appointee, as controller, uh, I think unless the Democratic candidate can come up with anything like that, and I don't know where she's going to get it, because I don't know who gives it to control. Alderman Burke in Chicago has $10 million in a campaign fund and likes her a lot. Well, he, yeah, he's going to have to like her an awful lot uh, <laughs> to offset the money that Governor Rauner could put in. Yeah. And whoever, if, let's say the Republican candidate has $3 million, or let's she gets $4 million and the Democratic candidate has $1 million, the Republican candidate's going to win that race, I think, just because people are going to go know her. They're not going to know the Democratic candidate. So, again, the money in that race could have a huge impact. And I don't think political scientists will be able to use that as the benchmark of Republican and Democratic voters in Illinois. Chris, what about you? Well, I'd just echo the, I'd, the extent I'd you like want to Illinois. echo the, the first comment about the importance of the budget. When I was running the Merchandise Smart Center, more companies moved to Illinois to open an office for the first time at the Mart Center than any other location in the state by a mile. And let's say there were 5,000 companies and exhibitors that I dealt with during that period. Not one of those companies, not one of those companies who moved to Illinois, opened an office, hired people, paid taxes here. Not one of them ever asked me about redistricting reform or term limits or tort reform or workers' comp. Nobody, nobody ever asked. But now, as we're building on Wolf Point, we've got a billion dollar development. You know, the investors, the folks from all over the world, why should we invest in the only state that doesn't have a budget? It's rattling people. It's, it's taking a state budget problem that's very clear to all of you and turning it into a statewide economic crisis. And it's scaring people away. It's creating uncertainty. And that is bad for the economy. And that's the biggest issue that we need to deal with. I agree with the governor's assessment of you know, the downstairs. I think like, people like Gary Forby and uh, Brandon Phelps are so well known to their, like, they have a personal relationship with their voters. Really difficult to move, move on them. Um, and then it's a little more chaotic in, in, in the suburbs. I would say that Susanna Mendoza, who's, who's, who's running for uh, um, controller, she is so charismatic that it would take a lot of money, I think, to offset you know, her, her story and her personal charisma. I think she's terrific. All right, we've got a couple more minutes. Let me just ask if each of you has a final thought about this election season, and I have one last question then. So uh, you had a few thoughts at the beginning, whether you've shared them already, but it's been, again, an arguably uh, wacky season. I think the word chaos in the title of our event fits this year pretty well. Um, Final thoughts in, as we had in the last 60 days. Well, I, I mean, it, I wish we could have this after the election. I could sound much more intelligent about how the election is going to go. Uh, in the nation, I mean, Donald Trump is just unusual. I mean, we've never had a presidential candidate, I don't think, in the 21st or the 20th century like him. So, you know, we kind of insiders, we people have been around the process, we kind of have certain standards or things you can and can't do, he kind of tossed that book out the window. Now, whether that works or not, we won't know for sure. So that's, that's an unknown. And how that affects other people in the ticket, we don't really know. Uh, in the state election, we have never seen this kind of money involved in legislative races. Never anything like this. Uh, and it's, it's, it's unusual, too. You've never seen... Uh, and I, I will give Governor Rauner a lot of credit. They th they're good at politics. They think politics. And, but we've never seen the governor have as much control on legislative races as this time. And uh, whether that works or not, I don't know. We'll, as I said, we'll have to wait and see how that turns out. So there are a lot of unknowns going into November that I don't think we can sit here and talk to the cows come in, and I'm not sure we really can predict What's going to happen? So the takeaways for November 9th will be the effect of so much money in legislative races, in the comptroller's race, money versus more charisma, and maybe nationally, whether we've entered the era of reality TV candidates, and maybe Trump isn't the last one. 
Uh, maybe, maybe Geraldo Rivera r runs next time. I mean, I'm just saying, so it, you have, we'll have to wait till the ninth. As strange as that sound and outrageous, after what's happened this year, I wouldn't All discount bets are, it. I Chris, would. Chris, final thoughts on the last 60 days in this season? I mean, I, I'd say that the, the people who are here today really represent the establishment in both of our parties. And the most likely to get involved, the most thoughtful, engaged citizens of this community. And I think we need to listen to these voters. They are raging. This is anger. You know, we grew up as the American dream of rising from rags to riches was the promise of our country, there, a place where anyone could make it. And people don't believe in that anymore. They're upset. They're angry. And they're willing to destroy everything we have if we don't fix that. And that's the message of this election. And, and let me leave with one question that is sort of the 800-pound gorilla in the room. If I don't ask it, I will lose all credibility as, the, as a former news guy and watchdog. So um, when we put this together several months ago... Is the ago, governor going to run? Well, we I tried. wish he would. Yeah, right. <laughs> Quick story. When Jim was trying to figure out whether to run for the a third term or the Senate, he was recovering from illness. And the question was, which would he run for? He ended up running for neither. I went to the state fair, and there was a fortune teller. So I went to the fortune teller, put a story on the news. What's the governor going to do? Well, the fortune teller told us that he was going to run for the Senate. Uh, history tells us he chose to run for neither. And if you want to thank him for something that's really nice, he gave us George Ryan, for better or worse. <laughs> anyway, thanks, Gov. No, but let me ask you, so when we put this together, you know, Karen recommended you. We thought it'd be great. Uh, you know, we're not non you know, we don't want to help you with a campaign that may or may not take place. You don't want to use us when we're... So give us an update on whether or not you think we'll see you in the governor's race, since I know you've been, you've been taking a close look at the possibility. No one in Illinois wants to talk about a 2018 race right now. All they're thinking about is 2016. I mean, I get poll calls five times a night at home. There's TV ads. You know, let's worry about this election, one election at a time. Thank you, Andy. Why was that... Are we going to let him get away with that? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.